he is celebrating his 20th anniversary this year. And I think this is our 99th program all on Newark history topics. So we're, we're, we're reaching our uh, 100th um, really in style. And we're really pleased that you are here tonight. Um, we're especially pleased that the Newark Public Library is co-sponsoring and hosting us tonight and providing the tech support for the um, uh, for those of, of you who are joining us on Zoom. And uh, we're also delighted that NJ NJPAC continues to uh, co-sponsor our programs. And I would like to ask Aisha Marable to bring a word of welcome as well. Appreciate you. Good evening, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Good evening. It is a beautiful spring evening. I am so glad to be here with you. To first say thank you to Tim Chris and this amazing partnership. We have been in partnership for a number of years and we are absolutely gratified to have this type of partnership. Um, work doesn't happen in New Jersey or in Newark without people co-creating and collaborating. And the only way that we can do great things is when there are no little eyes and big U's. And so we appreciate the opportunity to not only partner with um, Tim Chris and Newark History, but also Newark Public Library. They are an absolutely invaluable partner of ours. We do programming, 250 programs out in the community for free like this and at least 50 of them are with Newark Public Library and with Newark History Society. So we appreciate you. But we also have living in our home, in residence, New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. And they absolutely bring, I mean, resounding sounds, classical, beautiful sounds throughout the edifice. Uh, many times while they're practicing, we are working and it sounds glorious. And we are just so delighted at tonight that we hear the history of New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. I'm so glad that you're here tonight in person, but I'm really delighted that our virtual friends are here with us as well. And though you cannot be here in person, we're glad you're going to learn with us. We got a lot to learn. So let's sit back and relax and hear from our panelists. We'll hear more about Helen Paxson and Michael Redmond and Gabriel Van Alts, and we appreciate you all being here and sharing your knowledge. We need the wisdom. But I also want you to know that um, April 21st of 2023, the Philadelphia Orchestra will be at NJPAC, and they're going to be, will be featuring in October, It's at Perlman, and in November, Medora with Strings, Lucerne, and in March 2024, Joshua Bell. So we are a house of classical music, and we hope you come home to NJPAC. Enjoy tonight, and I turn it back over to you, Tim Chris. Thank you so much. So we're delighted to have three panelists tonight. Um, Helen Paxton, who's responsible for organizing this uh, program. Uh, Michael Redman and Gabriel Van Alst, as Aisha said, uh, they will each make their presentations. And then at the end, we'll ask them to come up here for a Q&A and we'll alternate questions from the, uh, the in-person audience and the uh, Zoom audience. Um, for those of you who are joining us by Zoom, it would help if you uh, post your questions in the chat or the Q&A as we uh, go along. And, and then I will look for them and pose them to the uh, panelists at the, uh, at the end. But our first presenter is Helen Paxton, known to many of you here, of course, um, a uh, communications and public relations professional for many years at Rutgers Newark and earlier a director of marketing and, and public relations for the New Jersey Symphony. Um, and I hope those of you who are here picked up a copy of this centennial history of the uh, symphony, which Helen is responsible for. And Daniela, I hope that we can uh, provide a, a link to a PDF of that history in the chat now, so that those of us who are joining us online can access it that way. Um, Helen is, 
is much more than a communications professional, though. It's uh, deeply grounded in music. She's published books, including one, An Introduction to the Music of Charles Ives. And as I said, she is responsible for this really lovely history of the New Jersey Symphony. Helen, get us started. Thanks everyone. I want to especially thank Tim for his willingness to uh, host this program. And I want to thank NJ Pack. And I really want to thank the symphony for uh, trusting in me to put together this history for their centennial year. Uh, I'm just going to uh, get started with a short comment. Uh, do I have the story next to it? I thought a lot about what makes a great orchestra in, uh, in writing and researching this topic and how to write its story. And I really came up with two things. Uh, a great orchestra is a large gathering of musicians, of course, which we know, but it also has the support of a community. And in the case of New Jersey, that is a very large and important community. And I tried to, in, in telling the history, to bring in that community support, because seriously, without that, orchestras do not exist. So let's just start with the uh, birth of American orchestras in the 19th century. Uh, Newark's Eintracht, which means harmony, uh, orchestra and singing society, was one of many ensembles around the country in cities that had a lot of uh, German immigration. And, and by the way, the uh, Newark History Society has a very good program on uh, German immigration in Newark. And uh, those people brought their love of music, of classical music, uh, to this country and is very much behind the birth of some of the, or the uh, country's oldest orchestras. The oldest is, of course, New York in 1842. I know I have to point it over there. Okay. So the Eintracht Orchestra and Singing Society is 1846. Uh, and it's, I, I tried so hard to find a photograph. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think it exists. If it does exist somewhere, we weren't able to find it. But just to give you a sense of how, uh, how vibrant musical culture was in this city, on the far left, you see Biederman's Boys Band from 1895. Um, this Newark Sunday Call, a uh, story about a new oratorio, and it refers to uh, members of several German singing societies of Newark under, uh, I don't know who conducted that. Maybe it was, uh, let's just pause here. It was composed by Gunter Kiesewetter, and on the far right, you see uh, the Kruger Auditorium on Belmont Avenue, that building no longer exists. And then while I was searching for a picture of the Eintracht, I came across this one picture of the Menor Corps of the Milwaukee Musik Verein or Music Society. And I would imagine the Eintracht looked a lot like that. So in uh, 1914, um, as uh, Things were changing in Europe. There was a lot of anti-German sentiment, and it prompted a name change for the Eintracht to the Newark Symphony Orchestra. The orchestra is led by conductor Louis Erke, and those music scholars in the audience might know the name of Josef Joachim. He's the most distinguished violinist of the 19th century Europe. He uh, was, uh, Louis Erke was a student of Joachim. And Erke was also conductor of the Haydn Orchestra of Orange. And I believe that picture on the far left, that must be Louis Erke. It's not identified. Uh, I think I won't read these quotes. You can read them. So in the 1920s, the orchestra, the, the musical activity moves to Montclair. And we have what is known as the first concert of the New Jersey Symphony. It was actually called the Montclair Art Association Orchestra for the first concert uh, in November 1922. 
And it was composed of players from the New York Symphony Orchestra, the Haydn Orchestra of Orange, and the Llewellyn Ensemble under the leadership of Philip James. So let's get back to uh, community supporting an orchestra. It's really kind of phenomenal, the, the people who were behind the foundation of this orchestra. So a few of them. William Dixon, who was a founding member of the Montclair Art Museum and why the first concert was probably held there, was a close associate of Andrew Carnegie and that wonderful home in Welland Road, which the home no longer exists, but there are some still grand houses there. Uh, and that's where the little Sorry, I guys. We are teaching that too. Russell Kingman, who is legendary with the orchestra's history, was a cellist, an industrialist, a friend of Pablo Casal, and he owned the uh, home Fiddlewood in Orange, where a lot of events took place after concerts. And as an inventor, I pulled up one of his little inventions, the chore boy. <laughs> uh, also, Louis Danberger, Hendon Chubb, and Sidney Colgate. From the beginning, the orchestra hired major soloists. Um, this handwritten note that you see in a program on the far left is really wonderful. We don't know who wrote it, probably Kingman. The Sauls didn't show up at rehearsal until half an hour before the concert and then took a wicked liberty. However, he played like an angel and came back with us to supper after the concert. So, um, did I miss a slide on Philip James? I did. Okay. So, just a little bit about Philip James. Uh, he's really an impressive figure, uh, multi talented, very ambitious. As a young man, he was drafted into the First World War, decided he didn't want to hold a gun and shoot people. And so, he quickly learned saxophone and joined the Army Band. And then, within two years, he came back to this country as the assistant bandmaster under the with the American Expeditionary Forces under General Burton. He was uh, <clears throat> choir director and organist at St. Luke's Church, which is very close to the museum. And so they uh, got him to be the first conductor. He did leave New Jersey in 1929 and had a major career as a uh, professor and a composer and retired as uh, Chair of the Music Department at NYU. So in the 1930s, Rene Paulin, who is a Frenchman, an assistant conductor of the New York Philharmonic Wolf of Damrach. Uh, Kingman, you see on the lower left there, traveled to France to meet him. And I would say this is probably my favorite quote that we included in the book. Before going to Paris, I'd heard extravagant praise of Mr. Paulin from French and Italian members of the New York Philharmonic. This is Russell Kingman writing. But they were Latins. So I cautiously acquired among, inquired among six members, German members of the Philharmonic, knowing that what a German might say about a Frenchman would perhaps be the real lowdown. But these Germans were, if anything, even more enthusiastic. <laughs> So progress abounds. Um, by my, 1930, we have multiple concerts in Montclair and Orange, and the repertoire expands with a French conductor to include W.C. Berlioz, Saint-Saëns, Bizet. And interestingly enough, the first year positions are filled by New York Philharmonic uh, players on their evening off. I absolutely love this little uh, newsletter that was published by the orchestra at the time, the Cadenza. Uh, and during this time, the orchestra expands to 100 musicians, two-thirds professional or semi-professional. So war looms. Holland returns to France. He actually dies fairly soon after that, sadly. And uh, we return to German and Austrian influences in the repertoire under Frieder Weissmann, who is also a very fascinating figure. Um, he had a big career in Europe, but of course, ran to 
rampant anti-Semitism forced him to leave first for South America and then to come here. War in Europe sets the stage for a really remarkable transformation. An almost all female orchestra under concertmaster Joan Kelsey as men are called into military service. Joan Kelsey, uh, born Joan Skolnick from Russia, uh, came to this country. She had a major career in Europe. She came to this country and met Frederick Kelsey, who was a board member of the orchestra, became concertmaster, I think, for 20, possibly longer. Again, I couldn't find a good picture, so I just pulled in uh, the Montreal Women's Symphony Orchestra, which was active from 40 to 1940 to 65. This is where the community really becomes a huge part of the orchestra under Sam Antec, uh, called the People's Symphony. Uh, Antec is he's just a remarkable figure, um, so much fun to read about. And I had the great pleasure of interviewing his daughter, Lucy Antec Johnson, about her father. Uh, he was a violinist under Toscanini, wrote a very very widely regarded book about Toscanini. Tall, handsome, full of energy and enthusiasm, and he worked with local residents to build a community supporting the orchestra. And for those of you who go back as long as I do and Michael does to the orchestra, you might recognize Betty McAllister from Maplewood. Yep, she's just an amazing lady, just uh, classic. Symphony. She, she just kind of lived for promoting the orchestra in, in Maplewood and places. So committees of local <laughs> residents built the community supporting the orchestra. And Tech is most famous for beginning a series of children's concerts, which has continued to this day to be a, a core mission of the orchestra. A couple of nice quotes um, from Antec. Today, the relationship between orchestra and community becomes even closer and more meaningful. The days of royal patronage and the rich angel backer are passing. And more than ever before, orchestras must be supported by the broadest cross-section of the people, both individuals and groups. This Lucy actually told me that he was a very good tennis player and he played tennis with some of the big wigs who were on the on the trustees, so I thought that was kind of fun. Um, and just to talk a little bit about community, this is not a good picture, but you see here a program with April the 9th uh, and the Oratorial Society of New Jersey, of which I'm a very proud current member. Uh, in the, uh, well, yeah, the April the 9th symphony. So, he was less concerned with whether children heard Beethoven or Leroy Anderson because to him the experience of enjoying music was paramount, according to Lucy. He had children uh, for, for the school concerts. He had kids provide uh, drawings. And what you see on the cover, and by the way, the lots of copies of the book there is a kind of, um, it's a little hard to see because of the contrast, but this is actually one of the illustrations from the children's programs. 30th anniversary, the soul and heart of the people are expressed in its spiritual, cultural, and artistic searchings and achievements through its great churches, museums, schools, and libraries, and today in more and more communities all over America through its symphony orchestra. This is a very, very sad uh, moment for the orchestra. Everything was booming and he died of a heart attack at age 49. Um, the Dutch conductor, Matis Abbas, is also an interesting person, uh, but I don't really have time to talk about him right here. Filled in briefly, I don't really know why his contract wasn't renewed. And so we get to the time when the orchestra really became known nationally and some, to some degree internationally. Um, over the next 15 years, this major orchestra emerged under Kenneth Skirmahorn and Henry Lewis, and the orchestra moved back to Newark. Newark became its home base. And 
I did title this talk, uh, the, uh, the event, uh, 100 Years of Harmony in some discord. This is where a lot of discord happened with rapid expansion. <laughs> so back to Newark, everybody recognizes that grand mosque theater, which was renamed Symphony Hall in honor of its new tenants under Skirmahorn. Uh, Skirmahorn was a protege of Leonard Bernstein. He introduced major 20th century works the orchestra expanded geographically, and there was huge musician turnover, which of course uh, contributed to some discord. Whoops. Yeah, okay. Uh, in 1969, two thirds of the orchestra members are newcomers. Uh, the growth of the orchestra is supported by a very dynamic board led by Henry Becton, Alan Lowenstein, Sidney Stevens. Some of you know all major players in New Jersey business and politics at the time. Um, with the growth came a lot of financial challenges. The Ford Foundation was absolutely key at that time in uh, coming to the rescue not only of New Jersey, but a lot of other American orchestras. Um, I love this program, wish I'd been there. I don't actually know when it was. This is with Benny Goodman as clarinetist. Um, the Mendelssohn Italian Symphony, very fun piece of music, followed by uh, Paul Maria von Weber's Concertino for clarinet with Goodman, the WC First Rhapsody for clarinet and orchestra with Goodman, and after intermission, the audience got to hear the Benny Goodman Jazz Quartet. So Skirmerhorn, uh, after a few years, left for Milwaukee. Um, among the highlights of his uh, tenure were premieres of works by Roger Sessions and Gunther Schuller, both very prominent American composers during the day. Uh, the New Jersey Tercentenary, uh, the Sym First Symphony Ball, and star soloists, including Joan Sutherland, the leading opera singer of the day internationally. Henry Lewis is when this orchestra really, really hits the quote big time. Uh, Henry Lewis was an absolute child prodigy. He became the youngest member of the Los Angeles Philharmonic at age 16, he was a bass player, and then spent years in the army as a conductor, and at age 29 was appointed assistant at the LA Phil under Zubin Mehta. He had guest appearances with major orchestras throughout the US and Europe and was appointed music director at the NJSF. His stardom was significantly enhanced by marriage to opera star Marilyn Horn. And I would love to know, maybe Michael knows, what was the story behind Henry because they moved from California to here. Don't know. And I tried to find out from Marilyn Horn, but she wasn't telling me. She was oh, slightly annoyed at my questions, actually. Um, and his fame really increased as he's identified as the first African-American conductor of a major US orchestra, which the NJSO had become during his tenure. Uh, this quote from Winthrop Sargent of the New Yorker, very prominent critic, First rate ensemble, this is after New York performance at Carnegie Hall. Mr. Lewis is therefore to be counted among the country's foremost orchestral trainers. Again, discord comes with growth. Uh, the budget grew to 1.3 million. I don't know what that is in today's terms. I should have looked that up. It's a lot uh, in a 36 week season, <clears throat> which is big. The schedule was absolutely exhausting. 100 performances in more than 25 performance locations around the state, Carnegie Hall, Kennedy Center, Wolf Trap Farm, et cetera. Um, players cite podium despotism as Lewis presses to bring the orchestra into the first year. And I'll just take a little sidebar. When I was talking with Larry Tambori, who is a former CEO of the orchestra and who I worked with, wonderful man uh, and leader, and he said, Helen, I've never heard of an orchestra who didn't think that there was a podium despotism. Um, actually, I don't think that is true with, with John Zhang and some other, but I thought that was kind of fun. Um, labor relations were extremely turbulent. There was a huge turnover in personnel. His repertoire was really stunning. Uh, 
Stravinsky, Hindemith, Ives, Bartok, Prokofiev, Copeland, Foss, Ruggel, Penderecki, and Ludoslavsky. I mean, that was new. And here are just some images from the world when years uh, in the center, International Festival of Visiting Orchestras featuring New Jersey. Uh, nice photograph of him on the left in the publication called New Jersey Music and Arts. And on the right, their 50th anniversary with uh, Marilyn Horn and Joan Sutherland, who were just rock stars of the day. This is something that I kind of pondered a lot in writing. Um, when you think back to 1968, a year after the Newark riots, Henry Lewis comes in and he wants to bring music to the people. And so they put together concerts in uh, downtown uh, Central Ward. And a friend of mine found this article in the New York Times Slums to hear New Jersey Symphony. I mean, that just really gave me a start. Um, anyway, you, you can read that. I thought it was, it, it made me swallow hard when I read that. But he cast aside whatever racism he encountered, which was probably a lot. And along with Alan Lowenstein, uh, diversity and inclusion became core components of the orchestra's mission, which is continued to this day. So the Lewis tenure ends uh, in 1976 after a three-week musician strike, uh, reduced government funding, growing deficits, and the orchestra scales back to 23 weeks. I think you can see the expressions of those two musicians. They're looking at him rather skeptically. I, <laughs> I thought that was kind of an interesting photo. And I'll just end my presentation with a quote from the distinguished music critic, Michael Redmond, who's here with us. The impact of that unexpected news, Henry Lewis leaving on the orchestra's morale was dramatic. They have never played so brilliantly these musicians. So I now have uh, the pleasure of introducing Michael. Uh, Michael worked uh, as classical music critic, feature writer, just uh, all around brilliant writer at the uh, Star Ledger for 20 years. Um, 15 of those I worked for the symphony, so we got to know each other very well. And uh, he's uh, definitely someone who knew a lot of ins and outs about what was happening with the orchestra. They didn't always appear in print, but <laughs> that's right. And I really appreciate him coming up from Delaware, where he lives now, to talk to us. Thank you. Can you hear me? I think so. Um, first of all, of course, I want to thank the History Society, and Jay Pack, and the orchestra for having me here. This is a return back home in a million ways. I'm a Newark boy. I was born in St. Michael's up the hill. I grew up in the North Ward on Clifton Avenue. And people don't know this, my very first job was right here in this library in high school, stacking books and doing what, what clerks do. This is a great institution, and then I'm so happy to be here. Okay. <clears throat> um, there's a quote from Stanley Walker of the New York Herald Tribune from the 1930s. Uh, when a good journalist dies, a lot of people are sorry, and some of them remember him for several days. <laughs> I, I, I cite this. Uh, in, we now live in a, in, a, in a culture of media celebrities, and uh, I don't believe in that and never have, and I've not come from that at all. Uh, I had, I figure, I, I looked into this, 4,000 byline stories in the Star Ledger over 25 years. 4,000. I was stunned, startled. When, when, when we put this together. Um, this, I'm not singing my own praises. This is what we all did. 
The other critics and, and arts writers were also as prolific. Uh, let's see. Um, from July 1991 to June 1992, uh, I happened to be able to locate, there were a hundred classical music reviews published in the Star Ledger. And that was not only me, but also uh, stringers by the name of Paul Summers and Peter Spencer were also reviewing. This, of course, is what isn't happening today. But I just wanted to point 100 reviews in a year. That's just classical music. All right. There were also jazz reviews and pop reviews and dance and theater and movies and the whole thing. Uh, it's interesting. I was chatting on the phone with Tim Page, a very uh, distinguished colleague, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, and music critic. And we both estimated that at the moment, um, there probably are no more than a dozen at the at the high end, two dozen uh, people making a living these days writing about classical music. There are lots of people doing the writing, but they're not making a living out of it. They're doing a million other things. And I just think that that's interesting uh, statistic. Now, now I read what we might call the mission statement of the talk. The story of the New Jersey Symphony from 1975 to 1995 is the story of New Jersey arts coming of age. The artistic achievement of the orchestra and the various crises it weathered were the catalyst for unprecedented developments that ultimately affected all of the arts statewide. A new climate emerged, addressing a range of issues, including professionalism, public, corporate, and private philanthropy, audience outreach, arts education, cultural facilities, and the revival of, of downtowns. The New Jersey Symphony established that it was possible to have a major professional orchestra serving the people of the state, an artistic entity recognized and respected for its quality by its peers throughout the country, bringing some of the world's most famous classical artists to New Jersey. But the orchestra's issues, issues crystallized various challenges facing all New Jersey arts institutions, such as general operating support, audience development, and facilities. Uh, the focus on the art scene brought about by the New Jersey Symphony led to the emergence of the self-aware arts community world uh, statewide, united in a common purpose, no longer fractured by the arts medium or by geography or by institutional size. It, it created an atmosphere of we are all in this together. <clears throat> uh, from my point of view, this is all made possible with what I was able to do by my editor, Mort Pye. Mort Pye uh, was editor, his picture, I'm not very techy. Yeah. Now I'll just keep talking. Um, Mort Pye, um, although not from New Jersey, he came from Rochester and he began his career in Long Island. Uh, became um, the long run in Star Ledger editor from 1963 to 1994, and became what I can only describe as a New Jersey patriot. He lived, breathed, et cetera, New Jersey. New Jersey was everything. Um, he and his wife, Pearl, would take two week vacations and guess where they went? They would drive all over the state to find out where things were and what people were doing and come back with a folder full of story ideas <laughs> right, that we were to do. Uh, I would joke that uh, there was a joke in the city room that the reporter who was sent out to cover the second coming of Christ had better return with the Jersey angle. Okay, all right. <clears throat> uh, Mort was a low key, quiet, thoughtful man. He shunned the spotlight, but he was dedicated to the newspaper and to the community it served. Uh, but he had a musical background. He was an amateur trumpeter and had played in bands as a kid. He was also a very good pianist, as I found out. Um, and he was therefore the perfect editor to have to ask the questions that needed to be asked. But what's going on with the New Jersey Symphony? Why is all this? Why is the orchestra running into problems? Why is there turbulence? Uh, and basically, I explained to him that 
basically, the labor problems that the New Jersey Symphony had in the 60s and 70s, there were two sides to that fight, and they both were right. That was the problem. The musicians wanted a full-time work at professional level salary and all the benefits, et cetera. They weren't asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, they, they wanted a real job with real pay and real benefits. And they had a union behind them to, to support that. You know. On the other hand, the board was faced with the issue of where do we find the money? Where's the money? How are we gonna pay for this? I don't think it's a, be uh, news to this audience that ticket sales for orchestra concerts, I, I think revenue is somewhere in the area of 30, 3%, 37%. Um, the rest of the budget of an orchestra has to be made up by philanthropy of some sort. Um, this is not, um, it not, would not be possible to have a symphony orchestra if the or audience paid the full freight. Families would not be able to go to the orchestra. We've seen this happen to Broadway, but I'll get, I'll get away from that. You know, the, the idea is musicians want to play, they want to play for people, they want to bring the music to people, but they also want some job stability. So both sides, as I said, of the fight were right. The musicians were right, and the board was right in pulling out its hair, all right, trying to find, pick up as much money as possible to support the orchestra. And the problem was, it was as it was soon, uh, well, let me give you an example. Um, the National Endowment of the Arts had its 10th year celebration in 1966. And therefore, the New Jersey State Council on the Arts had a celebration of 10 years of existence. Uh, at that time, the Arts Council budget was $1 million. For all of the arts of all the state for a year, $1 million. Uh, this is paltry, all right? This, this, the issue that became, I, I took back to Mort, is that we have this very low level of public funding, right? Also, in comparison to other states at its affluence, New Jersey corporations, foundations, and, and private individuals are not stepping up. And we were able to document this. Uh, what are some of the things I'm trying to find then? Oh, um, for many years, the largest single supporter of the arts in New Jersey was the Dodge Foundation of Morristown, New Jersey. They were giving more money to the arts in the state of New Jersey for a long time. Um, let's see, yeah. Uh, but everybody, including the National Endowment for the Arts, was making the point that New Jersey simply wasn't doing enough uh, for one of the wealthiest states in the union, that we ranked about 25th in the union for art support per capita expenditure we were spending 14.7 cents per citizen to support the arts. This was comparable to South Dakota, Nevada, and Maine. That was the level we were at. So I came back and Mort said, well, we've got to do something about this. And he instituted a thoroughgoing and continuing investigation of, of philanthropy for the nonprofit, for nonprofit philanthropy in New Jersey. It hadn't been done before. Who's giving, how much are they giving, how does this compare to other states, et cetera. And, and as I said, this, this rolled out. Um, an issue back then in the beginning was New Jersey was perceived as a cultural wasteland. That is literally a quote from Mason Gross, president of Rutgers University. He was referring to a broader uh, setting, but it stuck to New Jersey, New Jersey's culture. Uh, the state had no real perceivable identity. Uh, it had a terrible national image. It was a punchline because everybody thought that New Jersey was what you see from the New Jersey Turnpike. All right, that's what they, that's what they knew in New York. Um, and what are we going to do about this? Uh, so at that time, uh, the Star Ledger at, at its peak, which would have happened in the 90s, was the 14th largest daily newspaper in New Jersey, uh, in, in America, number 14, with a daily circulation around 450,000 and a Sunday circulation of 700,000. These are all documented figures, all right? Um, today, it's roughly a quarter of that. But in, I'm making the point that the newspaper had 
a statewide focus, and it had the it had the, the means and the power to start doing things. The Star the old Star Ledger, this was the glory days. The old Star Ledger was often accused of boosterism. Well, okay, but if the largest newspaper in the state isn't telling people what's right about New Jersey, or calling out what's wrong about New Jersey, or proposing solutions for New Jersey, who's going to? Who's going to do this? So this is the role, the role of, the, of, of, of good media. As a result of which, um, among the, even the New York Times admitted in its obituary of Mark Pye, that he was almost single-handedly responsible for the Hackensack Meadowlands development and for the completion of Route 80. And I would also add to that um, this amazing growth and development in the arts. Because we started, we, we, were, we were relentless. We went to, to find out information as to how to help, what the problem was, what could be done. All right, so um, also, uh, I want to credit in terms of the kind of coverage that I did of the Arts Council on various state issues, it would be remiss of me not to, me not to mention my colleague Valerie Segal, who actually did an awful lot of work as well. But the Arts Council meetings were covered, the issue was, was discussed, interviews were made. Um, everything that we could do to move an agenda forward. And what was the agenda? The agenda simply was to have a thriving, healthy, vibrant arts community serving as many people as possible throughout the state. Not just but the or and the orchestra provided a template for that, because it was only the New Jersey Symphony actually that was going all over in in in, in New Jersey. In Henry Lewis's uh, peak, uh, as Helen pointed out, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, let me see, I can't find it. Oh, no, wait, it's under Henry. Here it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, at, at, at Henry Lewis's peak, there was a 36 week season in which 100 concerts were performed in 25 locations in the state and out. Uh, out, out of state locations included Carnegie Hall, Kennedy Center, Wolf Trap, uh, et cetera. Um, this is an amazing level of commitment, and I'll, I'll go to we go to Henry Lewis. Uh, you know, back up. Henry arrived on the scene. He was brilliant. He was energetic. He had vision. He had drive. He was a fabulous musician, and he intended to make take the orchestra to the people. That's what started the touring and started the mission actually that continues pretty much to this day. Did, Henry also wanted to break down um, whatever barriers stood in the way of, of people accessing the orchestra and appreciating the orchestra. Let me see. Uh, yeah, this is a quote. It's indelicate, but I don't care. Uh, Henry Lewis established the New Jersey Symphony as a kick-ass band, meaning this is a band that was consistently punching above its weight artistically. They were better than they, than, than they had any right to be in this situation because they were good musicians and they were proud and they may be fighting like Dickens with a given conductor. But you know, when, when, when the A440 A sounds, they're gonna play as, the, as brilliantly as they're able. Uh, he did that. Uh, he was, he, he recognized that the orchestra needed to be built um, he, it, it, and it, you build an orchestra by hiring and firing, unfortunately, because it's all about the quality of players. Um, he also, he, there was a lot of that. Um, he helped negotiate the first union contract as a symphony orchestra, which I thought was amusing because previously the New Jersey Symphony was considered to be a club date band, all right, which I thought was really funny. Um, they got, they got professional contracts and created, Henry Lewis created a, a model for regional orchestras nationwide. But you can't work like this. You can't be giving 100 concerts a year in 25 locations. Um, Helen alluded to this. People got tired. People got demoralized, especially when an awful lot of those locations were pretty bad places to play in. 
New Jersey had a horrible facilities problem. There were very, very good, a, a very good situation acoustically and in many other ways in North Symphony Hall, but the rest of the state, not the same discussion. Um, there was a, a situation where I think John Heyer, previous executive director, pointed out that New Jersey Symphony was probably the only orchestra that had been rained out for an indoor concert. All right. <laughs> This actually happened. I'm not going to give you, I'm not, I'm not going to point to the theater because it's been revived. But another point, one of the brightest lights in the state theater circuit now is the state theater in New Brunswick, which thanks to the state of New Jersey, the city of New Brunswick, Johnson & Johnson, Rutgers University, is a jewel of a theater. Uh, how do I say this? It had fallen into such low a state that it was operating as a porn, a porn theater. It was the only place in New Brunswick to play. So the orchestra staff, they created enormous posters and, um, and they would have to go down and plaster over all of the uh, previews of coming attractions. All right. And clean the theater and make sure everything was great. I mean, this is what orchestra people had to go through. All right, this is crazy. Um, <clears throat> all right, so. Unfortunately, I have so much here, it's, it's crazy. Uh, all right, all of this came together and it really began bubbling under the governorship of, of, of Brendan Byrne, uh, Governor Soto. Yeah, here we go. Uh, governor Byrne, um, although he does not seem to have much of a reputation as an arts guy, he actually really was. He attended an awful lot of performances and uh, et cetera, but he was appealed to, and he was brave enough at, at, at some point to actually double the Arts Council's budget in one year from 1 million to 2 million. Uh, let's see, he was responsive. And welling up throughout the state, it wasn't only the Star Ledger, but a lot of other places, it was the issue of New Jersey identity, New Jersey image, state pride, um, we want people to know this is a great place to live in, to work in, to visit, to, to do business in. All right. And also the issue of the routine trashing of the reputation of the city of Newark, <clears throat> uh, which remained a vibrant community despite its challenges and problems. So uh, it came, um, Byrne started, but in came his successor, Tom Kane. And Tom Kane was totally arts down. Uh, he loved them. He was very, very surprisingly uh, knowledgeable about them for somebody in, in politics. And it was personal with Kane. And he launched this uh, New York. New York had had I Love New York campaign. So a, the example became New Jersey and you perfect together. Do we remember that? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, the governor is on TV wandering the beaches, telling, pe right, telling people, that New Jersey and you were perfect together, come for tourism, this great stuff, nice glamour shots running behind him of the attractions in New Jersey. Um, but there had to be more, if people were to come to New Jersey, there has to be something to come for, all right? Um, so he felt that the arts had a great role to play in revitalizing areas, providing opportunities for people uh, uh, to, to enrich their lives. Uh, oh, also he was a history buff, which is very relevant to this organization. Uh, John Cunningham was the founder of the Friends of the Library. Uh, they cribbed a, 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 a slogan from him, Crossroads of the Revolution, to try to acquaint people with the fact that we have incredible history in New Jersey. Um, Massachusetts takes that to the bank. Virginia takes that to the bank. What are we doing? All right. The revolution basically was won here. You know, all of this came together. Uh, uh, so Kane, Kane decided that, 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 that we were going to support major institutions with a uh, possibility or a reasonable chance of achieving na nation, national recognition because we have to tackle the image problem. All right. Uh, so 
he felt that small grants to fledgling organizations would accomplish little, that we needed to do something big. So that's what they started doing. Uh, this, however, has now, that ball started rolling and it has continued to roll through subsequent administrations. And I'm trying to remember, I have that figure here because it astounds me. Uh, Governor Murphy, in the current proposal, the current Arts Council proposal, proposed budget is $31.9 million, $31 million. So we're talking from 1975, $2 million. To today, $31.9 million. And there has been a, generally speaking, a, a, a high level, a, a plateau is reached and adhered to with some increases along the way. But that plateau, what I call the supercharging of this, uh, happened under Kane. And it isn't only government. Uh, the corporations, Kane basically would call up CEOs and yell at them. I don't mean yell in the sense of being offensive, but put heat on them. Uh, made it very clear the governor was very interested in what your corporation is doing in terms of your philanthropy. It's important to the state. It's important to me. Thank you. Bye. All right. Um, he would show up at a major arts events uh, in the state on a regular basis, including numerous New Jersey Symphony concerts. Uh, this was, all, and then all of a sudden the CEOs started showing up at major corporate events. All of a sudden it was no longer the second tier vice presidents or anything. The CEOs began showing up in purpose um, in, and in person because they could hobnob with the governor. Uh, this, this was going on all the time. Uh, okay. Supporting, the, but this was a bipartisan situation. And I want to get back to the orchestra, but the whole, the whole, this was a whole area of dream big. During, you had the Hack, Hackensack Metal and Sports Complex. You, the initial bonds for that were bought by Pru and New Jersey banks, which is the first time New Jersey funded such an enormous project from within itself. And the reason this happened is that the New York investors were not keen on the Hackensack Meadowland Sports Complex. You know, they weren't keen about bringing giants from the Bronx to the Hackensack Meadowlands. So there was trouble. So they got together. This they got together, uh, Pru and the banks, and they bought the first issue, and the, the whole project took off from there. Uh, dreaming big. Uh, Atlantic City casinos. It was thought to be a good idea at the time. <clears throat> the, the Camden Aquarium, Liberty Science Center in Jersey City, and the foundation of the New Jersey Motion Picture and Television Commission, which has brought an awful lot of business into New Jersey. Uh, all of this was happening. Uh, all right, so um, I want, uh, we were talking about Henry Lewis. I want to go back into the more musical aspects of this because I don't want to ignore that. Yeah. Um, give me. Well, Henry Lewis was followed by Thomas Mahalik. Uh, Thomas Mahalik was very was equal, equally brilliant uh, musician, uh, but a totally different personality. And the relationship um, between Maestro Mahalik and the orchestra went downhill in a very major way. Uh, he, within two years of, of Mahalik's uh, music directorship, half the orchestra was new. He would fire musicians on the spot, on, you know, on the spot, gone. Uh, he was a fanatic about sound, which is a good thing in a conductor, but when you audition 100 clarinetists, from the greater New York pool of some of the greatest, big, greatest, most talented music pool in the world. You audition 100 clarinetists for your principal's chair and don't find one that meets your exact, yeah, that meets your standards. You have to wonder what's going on here, All right? Uh, Thomas was a throwback to the conductor dictators of the 1930s and 40s. Let's be blunt, Toscanini, Chris Reiner, uh, George Zell, these are totally different kind of conductor where the conductor actually was God, all right? 
And uh, this is not going to play in the 1970s. And I don't think Thomas realized that. Um, he had come from Poland. He came from a radically different culture. And uh, uh, he was very confrontational about anything that he viewed as an infringement on his artistic position. And one thing left to another, and he was gone. Too. Uh, it was pity because he was an, also an amazing conductor that conducted absolutely memorable performances. He was had a, a, a very intense music, very almost feral sometimes. And by feral, I don't mean undisciplined. I mean a sense of wildness, a sense of we don't know what's going to happen next. And that's something that's very fun in the classical repertory where every note has been known for 100 years. But to create that sense of something new happening right in your face in, 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 in a symphony that you've heard 100 times. All right, so that he was amazingly talented and died at age 46, very sad. Then came Hugh Wolf, and ha thank heaven for Hugh Wolf. Also brilliant, radically different kind of conductor. I dubbed him the man with the x-ray ears. Um, he had, he brought in incredible fineness of detail, translucency of texture, many things that, 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 that the orchestra, it lit up the orchestra. And he wrote, and I'm, I'll read this, he, he praised the orchestra as always giving him 110%, which is a lovely thing. And he said that he meant to expand the New Jersey Symphony's range in a variety of senses, its repertory, its stylistic diversity, its geography, and hopefully its audience. He wanted the NJSO to be quick on its feet, because that's the only way for the orchestra to survive. Mahalik had a narrower but very powerful vision. This is you, Wolf, speaking. Um, he went for the color and sound associated with the Slavic repertory, but I conceived my mission to be something quite different. We weren't going for a U wolf sound, but for the range and flexibility that would enable the New Jersey Symphony to sound like a different orchestra every time, to produce different styles, different sounds equally well. For me, the highest compliment is to be applauded equally for Handel, Beethoven, Debussy, Mahler, Bernstein, for whatever style or period of music you are playing. Um, things calmed down uh, with the advent of greater support, the, the advent of uh, uh, a greater support for the orchestra. And I have should end up with the facilities issue uh, is that it's immediately relevant to Newark. Uh, a consensus emerged, which is like a passive voice trying to avoid all right, a consensus emerged that we had to have a new art center. That, that if, if New Jersey was going to make a, 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 real, a real statement about the arts, that raising all this money, which the state did, to renovate the old theaters is a great idea, but that isn't going to do the job. To make the statement, we need a big project. We need a world-class performing arts facility something that will make everybody sit up and take notice. And that was the birth of NJ Pack. And the soul of NJ Pack is the orchestra. And the, the, well, it was conceived to be the orchestra, but as we all know, of course, it's a wide ranging and diverse performing arts center, and so it should be. Uh, but, okay, I guess, I guess I'll stop. What I'm, what I'm, I'm I've surprised myself because I simply have too much here. And there are, too, there, there are too many issues, too many personalities, um, but I'd be happy to take questions and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Michael. It is wonderful to have you back in Newark and I hope it doesn't take quite so long to get you back next time, but we'll follow up in the Q&A. And we're delighted that Gabriel Van Alst, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Symphony is here with us. I think you joined about seven years ago from the, uh, Saint, uh, uh, the Academy of St. Martin's in the field in, in London. Uh, and before that from Australia. Um, but it's terrific to have you here, Gabriel, to talk about the 21st century. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. Is that good? Yeah, we can hear. Uh, 
Thank you very much. I'm privileged to be the CEO of the New Jersey Symphony. And as we were just getting to there, we were hearing about the opening of NJPAC and how it became a catalyzing moment for the state, but also for the symphony. And you might think that the orchestra took a breather for a moment in the early 2000s because we had this beautiful facility just across the way, um, but actually it continued to bring out major changes for the symphony. In particular, in 2003, two transformational things happened. Um, if we can, I did, I, but maybe it's fine. It's photos of our music directors. You can imagine them. They're all beautiful people, models, uh, cover mag covers of magazines. It's all good. Um, if you can't imagine that, we can, you can jump on your phone. Um, in any event, in 2003, uh, two transformational things happened. First, the symphony secured 30 precious instruments, including a number of Stradivarius and Guarneri's, the collection of instruments, which were dubbed the Golden Age Collection. And then the orchestra went on to appoint international superstar conductor Naimi Yavi as its incoming music director to replace the Denik Bacall, who's just up there, who had decided to step down. Superstar was not an understatement when it came time to describe Yavi. Prior to coming to the New Jersey Symphony, Yavi had amassed a discography of over 350 recordings with many of the great orchestras of the world, including the Scottish National Orchestra, the Gothenburg Symphony, and the Detroit Symphony, where he was ending his time as music director. The world took great notice because all of a sudden, New Jersey Symphony had a brand new hall in NJPAC with the best acoustics in the tri-state area, I might add, an internationally renowned conductor and was performing on some of the world's greatest instruments. It was the orchestral equivalent of having a great job, a great home and a great love life, a real triumphant and a major coup for the orchestra that had been nestled between New York Philharmonic and the Philadelphia Orchestra. Programmatically, Yavi's first two seasons continued to evolve the orchestra's repertoire and introduced New Jerseyans to music by Estonian compatriots Evo Part, Martinu and Tubin. Northern European composers cropped up frequently in his programming with well-known as well as rarely performed works by Grieg, Sibelius and Nelson. Continuing a tradition, Yavi promoted performing and commissioning contemporary music and also programmed big buckets of classical repertoire like Haydn's London symphonies, all of the Beethoven piano concertos and symphonies in one season, all playing a part in increasing the symphony's subscription base. But despite all this, ask a symphony member or a symphony audience member, and they'll tell you that Yavi was known for his engaging, friendly onstage personality, and perhaps most of all, his encores. No concert with Yavi was complete without an encore, or maybe two, or sometimes even three. And Neme knew and continues to know how to drive an audience wild asking for more. Those of you playing along with the timeline probably realize that the great times can't last because unfortunately 2008 with its recession is just on the horizon. And the Holy Trinity that I referred to earlier was about to face some huge challenges. When the recession hit, fundraising became immensely challenging and the orchestra had been accumulating significant deficits in the 2000s. And it was determined that the best move for fiscal stability would be to sell the Golden Age collection. In addition to our own financial challenges, Herbert Axelrod, who had initially collected and then sold the instruments to the symphony, had been convicted of tax fraud unrelated to the symphony or the instrument sale. Despite this fact, media coverage conflated this development with the revelation that the initial $50 million valuation of the Golden Age collection by an at the time prominent German dealer had been overblown. As a result, the symphony was seen by some to have made a poor decision in acquiring the instruments. Yet, as the story ended, after the profitable sale of the collection to a pair of New York investors, the symphony was able to pay off its debts. In addition, the investors generously offered that the musicians could perform on the instruments for a further five years. All agree now that the collection yielded significant benefits, not least of which was making possible the continuation of great symphonic music throughout New Jersey. The pain of losing ownership of the price instruments was at least made more tolerable by the, by the uh, newly acquired organi organizational stability. 
It wasn't long, though, before Nemes Energy began to take him in other directions. And in 2005, he began to become chief conductor of the resident orchestra of The Hague and eventually resigned from the symphony in 2009 to be replaced by the Canadian conductor Jacques Lacombe. Um, no, it's fine. Jacques is also a handsome man holding a baton. He's wearing a tuxedo. He's in front of many other handsome men and women um, who are playing instruments. You will be shocked to hear. Um, <laughs> there was an almost instantaneous change at the symphony as Jacques quickly differentiated himself from prior music directors through an innovative approach to programming, evident in his first symphony winter festival, a collection of themed concerts taking place across the state each January. Jacques relished in drawing together collaborations across art forms, as was evident in his first festival titled Man and Nature, an exploration of the element in music, and featured performances of Handel's Water Music, La Mer by Debussy, Elga Sea Pictures, and more contemporary works by Edward Cohn, Tandan, and Picker. Subsequent festivals were themed around fire and earth, with Lacombe commenting, the idea behind Man and Nature Winter Festivals is to connect what we do on the stage to our daily lives, using nature and environments as links. And I'm very pleased with how we in the concert hall were able to reflect our world on the beauty of nature and how important it is to treat it well. In four seasons, we have included many groups from our communities in the Winter Festival, theatre companies, choirs, and environmental organizations. Under Jacques' tenure, the symphony was not just a jewel in the state's crown, but also an organization that fostered and supported other organizations, working with them to use our platform in order to elevate others. With the sparkling showcase of NJPAC's Prudential Hall and its proximity to New York City, prior administrations had determined that annual performances at Carnegie Hall, which were not vital, in favor of these expanded winter festivals, which required greater investment in order to support the cross art form collaborations. Ultimately, it was felt that we would prefer to support our home growing talent than head across the river. However, after six years of the orchestra's absence from New York stages and word of these innovative programs, Thread spread throughout the classical music world, and CEO Andre Gremier was thrilled to receive an invitation for what would be the New Jersey Symphony's 22nd performance at Carnegie Hall, this time as a participant in the 2012 Spring for Music Festival, an unconventional program of music by Varus Weil, uh, Bersoni's massive piano concerto with fellow Canadian Mark andre Hamlin as soloist, Ernst Lacombe and the symphony, excellent reviews from the often hard-edged New York critics. Uh, Anthony Tomasini, who's still reviewing for the New York Times, reported it was an honor to be in the hall for this astonishing performance. During Jacques' tenure, the orchestra's long-standing tradition of promoting contemporary music continued to involve, evolve, when in 2014, the orchestra established the Edward T. Cohen Composition Institute, a partnership with Princeton's Department of Music and Professor Stephen Mackey. Each year, our musicians would perform works by standout young composers from across the, across the country through a week of workshops, culminating in a full orchestral performance. This gave young composers an opportunity to work directly with our musicians and receive feedback from them in their composition uh, process. Edward Cohn, who was a major donor and friend of the symphony, had been a distinguished and influential music history theory professor and a composer for many years, and the project represented a fusion of the symphony's mission and his dedication to pedagogy and new music. On the other end of the spectrum, the symphony also presented the New Jersey Roots Project, where the orchestra and Lacombe focused on a variety of composers born in or in some way influenced, were in some way influenced by the state of New Jersey. So the orchestra was able to virtually and musically travel around the state and present concerts that were really focused on the community here. But once again, times were changing and having evolved and elevated the symphony, Jacques' love for conducting opera caught him away and the time came for another music director. And here, you'll have to imagine a slightly different picture because we don't have a man in a tuxedo. We have a wonderful Asian woman standing in front of the orchestra, and that woman is Shen Zhang, the current music director of the symphony. If there was ever to be a fresh breath of air 
over the New Jersey Symphony, it would have to come in the shape of young Chinese American Shen Zhang, who first worked with the symphony orchestra as a guest conductor in 2010. She had already made a very big impression in the US where she'd served as the assistant and then associate conductor of the New York Philharmonic from 2005 to 2009. Yet as she recently noted, it took her from moving from New York to Milan to take over the Giuseppe Verdi Orchestra before she was invited to come across the river. Something we should have rectified earlier, but noted Shen. Um, at that time, she was only 37 years old. The invitations kept coming. And as Shen continued to come as guests in 2012 and 2015, while Jacques was music director, it became clear to everyone involved that she was going to be the next music director of the symphony. Shen once again provided, proved to be a thrilling leader who has already established a strong rapport with the orchestra, wrote Ronnie Reich in the Star Ledger that year. Her innate musicality and ability to communicate intention with clarity invested in every gesture. Nothing seemed extraneous or glossed over, even as her whole body seemed to contract and release with explosive energy. And for those of you who have seen her, that is the absolute perfect description of Shen conducting the symphony. Since taking up the mantle of music director, Shen has made a distinct mark on the profile and success of the symphony. With her contract recently reviewed, renewed to 2028, she spoke proudly of having worked with the musicians to create a richer, fuller sound. With that sound, the musicians have explored much of the standard orchestral repertoire, while also diving, delving into music written by a diverse group of American contemporary and British composers, including Maria Schneider, Aaron Kurnis, Conrad Tao, Anna Klein, Sarah Cook and Schneider, Kate Whitley, China's Tan Dun and Chen Yi. If you're playing along and listening to what I'm saying, you're probably picking up a theme there that may not have appeared in at the orchestra before Shen's time. As a core work of her, uh, as, a, as a core tenant of her work as a conductor, Shen believes that access and inclusion are important values to concert life today a belief that she shares with the orchestra's players, the board of directors and the team at the administration. She is pleased with the substantial increase in the number of women conductors now active in for what was for centuries has almost been exclusively a male profession. She also celebrates increasing numbers of people of color who are outstanding conductors and performing artists. And her belief is that music is truly universal. And with a welcoming atmosphere and attitude, there's no limit to the number and variety of people who can find joy in the concert hall. And that has been reflected in her programming. Bringing together Eastern and Western cultures, Jen has given the symphony audiences a new way to celebrate in the dark days of winter through her Lunar New Year celebration. These community events draw on diverse talents of classical and traditional instrumentalists, singers and dancers in a festive family type atmosphere. In continuing dedication to bring classical music to as broad an audience as many, Shen appointed Jose Luis Dominguez to be the artistic director of the, uh, the symphony's Newark based, based youth orchestra program in 2017. One of his first initiatives was to form a new ensemble, the training ensemble, specifically for children from the greater Newark area and a nod to the youth orchestra's original mission of serving the children of Newark. However, in an unwelcome reflection of the early 2000s, all would not be smooth forever. The biggest challenge, of course, in the decades was COVID, which was about to hit us in 2018, in March 2020. 2018, that was early COVID. Um, with only a few days notice, uh, rehearsals and concerts were silenced. And the organization whose mission was to bring people together in a singular space, it was a terrifying time as the symphony's artistic administration and musicians worked together to explore what could be done, the creative spirit emerged in spades. Instead of playing concerts with live audiences, the symphony would concentrate on video production, often from musicians' homes, and reap large benefits by reaching thousands of new listeners. And when I say thousands, what I actually mean is up to 14 million viewers from all across the globe. The result can be seen on our YouTube channel, but we're particularly proud of two films that were produced during the pandemic entitled Emerge and Transcend, which were created by the Newark based production company Dreamplay and told the story through music, documentary footage and dance of the experience of Newark during the pandemic. Audience around, audiences around the world were transfixed and the symphony won the first of two Emmys for those projects last September.
18 months later, the atmosphere at season opening of the concerts in October 21 was pure joy as people returned to the hall. The orchestra's return to Newark and NJ Pack was lauded in the New York Times, and the orchestra was described as an essential orchestra. Coming out of the pandemic, the orchestra was determined to continue to reframe itself, not just as a great arts institution based here in Newark, but as an organization charged with serving the community. We doubled down on our offerings, offering opportunities for community members to engage by going to them and not requiring them to come to us at the concert hall. Whether that was an outside concert in downtown Newark in the summer, or taking music to patients in Beth Israel Hospital, or performances in Bethany Baptist Church as part of Jazz Vespers, the orchestra was determined to spend much, as much time off the main stage as it was performing here at NJPAC. This work and Chen's leadership driving this community focused approach has been lauded by national press. Alex Ross, the music critic of The New Yorker, pointed to Shen as the model for the 21st century music director, one who understands the role that music can play, not just as entertainment, but as a community builder and placemaker. Another year later, Shen and the orchestra to continue to grow from strength to strength during our centennial celebrations with record audiences and sold out houses. Shen won her first Grammy, taking her halfway to an EGOT for those playing along at home and continues to envision a world of expanding the repertoire for symphony orchestras and coming up with plans for greater impact within the community. A world where the symphony takes pride in highlighting underrepresented voices. And she predicts that within the next few decades, more than 50% of the music performed by symphony orchestras will be composed by women and people of color. As you've heard tonight from all three of us, the New Jersey Symphony has always been an organization dedicated to serving the needs of our communities. And as we enter our second century, we hold that dedication to our hearts and that the resiliency that we've shown through the last hundred years and the creativity of our musicians lead us into the future. And I personally can't wait to see where it takes us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Helen and, and Michael and, and Gabriel. If you can take a few questions here. Um, and Helen, I, uh, one is of the things. Is this on? Is this on? I think it is. Or Eric. Oh, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry we didn't have the photographs up for Gabriel's talk, but there's plenty of photographs in the book, and there are plenty of copies of the book over there by the sandwiches. So please take part. Are there any questions from the, um, the audience? Um, Helen, one thing I noticed is it was in the Schirmerhorn era that they that founded in Newark in 1846. So, so what is the, uh, if you went with 1846, you'd nearly be with the New York Philharmonic. But, uh, That's right. Four uh, years, you, only four years difference, but yeah. it, it was a, a singing society, singing society, essentially, I think, you know, singing and music society. It couldn't really call it an orchestra. But the New York Philharmonic, by the way, didn't start out as the New York Philharmonic. It started out with a different name, Symphony Society or something, but it was essentially an orchestra. This was a little different. Anybody else? Um, you know that Victor Parsonet was so devoted to the orchestra, um, and he went through that difficult period with the uh, the instruments and such. Uh, what difference has board leadership made um, in in recent decades? Um, they keep me in check. No, um, <laughs> I think. Um, from my perspective within the orchestra, board leadership is really a, a combined tool, as we heard Michael talking about the, the, the way that orchestras are structured financially requires a huge amount of philanthropy, and that requires a huge amount of advocacy. And board chairs, particularly Victor, became sort of the notable one. Victor was famous for uh, cornering CEOs and cornering people and helping, get, helping them uh, and enlighten them to why the symphony needed their support and needed them to step up and support the community that had in turn supported them and helped them in their careers. 
Um, today, the board chairs sort of play a slightly different role um, in that they become community advocates. Our current board chairs are Bob Garrett, who runs Hackensack Meridian, and Anne Borowick, who uh, was formerly at JP Morgan. And both of them act as advocates, both in terms of their personal remit, um, but celebrate the story of the symphony and try to connect us to as broad of people as possible to make sure that all across the state, people realize that there's a treasure here in New Jersey. I'll just add in, in the book, there is a, a sidebar on Victor Parsonet and it's truly an inspiring figure and comes from a very inspiring family. So- And a Newark family originally. A Newark family, yeah. absolutely. His, his parents were phenomenal. His father was a board member of the symphony in the 1940s or- I, don't I know. should know, yeah. but at any rate, yeah. it is in the book, so. Say it with confidence, we'll all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Another question? Question in the back. Yeah, hi. I, recently, there have been collaborations with Montclair State um, with Heather Buchanan and the chorus. And I'm not sure historically if there's been much collaboration. I know I remember back many years, Ryder maybe, or Westminster Choir College. But I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of interaction with Rutgers or Princeton or anyone else. And, and I wonder if somebody wants to talk about that a little bit. So, so there have been lots of collaborations with Princeton in particular. Um, we, we still perform to this day in Richardson Auditorium regularly. That's part of our subscription series. Um, and the Cone Institution that I was talking about with the new composers is, is a collaboration with Princeton. Actually, this weekend, plug, 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 um, Steve Mackey, who I talked about, who runs the Cone Institute, is one of the great composers in America right now has commissioned, uh, we, we commissioned him for the centennial to write a new piece, which is written with uh, Tracy K. Smith, the poet laureate, former poet laureate, and Princeton Glee Club is going to be singing with us. So there is a collaboration just this weekend um, on an NJ pack uh, on Saturday night, uh, get your tickets here, there, everywhere online. Um, and in terms of Rutgers, I will say that we have sort of constant evolving relationship with Rutgers. They were the home, uh, they have been the home for our youth orchestra program for many, many years uh, in Bradley Hall. And, you know, we didn't get to talk about the youth orchestra much, but it's 30, 25 years, I'm looking at my, 32, oh my God, it gets, everyone gets older at the moment. It's the pre-pandemic age was 25. Uh, but 32 years old, and for many of those years, uh, it was housed in Rutgers, so, yeah. I have a question from, or uh, comment from uh, the chat, and if I, and we'll go back and forth if we have. Uh, and Michael, this might be one that you could speak to. Uh, Edward Ross says, I thought I heard that someone like Isaac Stern said that the old symphony hall had incredible acoustics among the best on the East Coast. Is that true? Uh, yes, um, New York Symphony Hall has very fine acoustics and always has. Uh, this is a long discussion. I have information here. I wanted to get into it. I ran out of time. I'll deal with it a little bit now. Uh, those of us who love to Symphony Hall, and I include myself, all right, um, we're of the hope or the expectation that if you revive Symphony Hall, this would lead to a revival of South Broad Street District and be good for everybody and everything. Um, I would submit as a personal opinion, but it's not my, only my own, that we got it exactly backwards. Meaning that in order to revive New York Symphony Hall, you have to revive uh, the South Broad Street District first, all right, um, or, or you're not going to do, and, you're not gonna have much success. And the revival of the South Broad Street District was much too heavy a lift for anybody to really think about 20, 30 years ago. I see that it's happening now and it's great. Um, Symphony Hall is there, the city owns it, uh, the city uh, maintains it. And I feel that there is a future there, I'm not sure exactly when it will emerge, but as a genuine community center. Um, and I would applaud that. And I, I know that they do performances there and, and, and there's activity. And I would hope it would reach the point where the city of Newark could be proud to have two 
vibrant, booming performing arts centers. That, that would really be absolutely terrific. But the impetus, as I said, and I, I want to talk about Newark a little, um, the impetus for a new performing arts center certainly came from the Kane administration and actually was probably first articulated by the then chairman of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, Margaret Hager, who pointed out that through the that that if you for all the money that would be needed to fix all the problems of the facilities throughout New Jersey, we may as well take that amount of money and build new. And people lit up with that idea. Uh, among the people who lit up was Sharp James. The mayor was an incredible booster of the NJ PAC uh, uh, project right from the beginning. As a matter of fact, he had a, a statement that is really famous in a way, in, insofar as it really blew away opposition to the project in Newark. Because um, Sharp stood up at some point and basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, but you'll get, we all remember what Sharp was like. All right. He said, well, you know, when they're talking about where they want to locate a prison or a halfway house or an AIDS treatment center or a waste treatment plant, Nort's just fine. But you want to talk about a performing arts center, building a big performing arts center. Apparently, there's a problem. Well, that shut up a lot of mouths. <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, the idea was, they said, it had to be a big project. And, and you also had here in our city, um, Sam Miller, God rest his soul, uh, and the Newark Museum of Art had just had a wonderful expansion using Michael Graves, very successful, everybody was raving. So you had the Newark Museum, you had this institution, um, you had the, the colleges real close, on and on. The North Broad Street area needed work, but it didn't need the kind of work the South Broad Street area needed. So this was, a fairly obvious solution, which is to create an arts district, educational district here in the North Broad Street area and cross our fingers and pray that revival then begins to spread throughout the downtown core in the entire city. And I think we're seeing a little of that and thank heaven. Um, the other thing that I, the other story again, um, <clears throat> why did they decide to do this in Newark? Why build a new theater in Newark? Well, they, the Kane administration went out and they had a competitive process and hired a very nationally respected art consultant named Carl Shaver. And they did all of this so they wanted to be hands off so that no one would say of the given choice that there was any agenda here. You, you know this stuff, you come and tell us what you think. Now, I kind of at that time felt, oh gosh, they're going to come back and say, put it somewhere on Route 78. Or, I, I, you know, they're going to put it somewhere in the Green Dells. It's going to be, you know, I, I just re had resigned myself to that. Well, Shaver came back and said, well, there's only one place, you know, to put this, the city of Newark. And everybody, I said, whoa, he pointed out very simple. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely simple that at that time, in terms of these numbers, 4.5 million New Jerseyans live within a 25 miles of the city of Newark. Of a, of a state whose population at that time is 7.5 million. And Newark has unparalleled tr uh, transportation access, et cetera, which has always been a, 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 a great selling. There is no other place in New Jersey really to do this. You have to do it in Newark. And the beauty of that, as I said, is that nobody was pulling strings. This was an independent, objective study done by a guy who'd done Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, cities throughout the country, and that was the answer. So everybody said, yeah, right, let's do it. Um, Brian? My question was for Michael, too. Uh, you were speaking about how uh, Mort Pye and the Star Ledger uh, campaigned so hard for supporting arts. Uh, did that have an effect? I mean, what was the, um, what was the payoff of that? Did the uh, wealthy uh, part of uh, New Jersey decide to um, have a more philanthropy? I, I don't think I heard it. I don't think I heard you, sir. Would you rephrase it? Yeah. Uh, did did the people with money start giving more money to the arts? As yes. We saw to the Star Ledger. Okay. How did that work? Yeah. Uh, it was the idea. I talked a lot about the public funding sources. 
But there are absolutely corporate heroes in the story, and there are people of, of great private means who are heroes of the story. New Jersey has always had these people. But New Jersey, as Benjamin Franklin said, and, 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 and Helen quoted in this excellent book, Benjamin Franklin said 100, 200 years ago, New Jersey is a keg tapped at both ends. One end is tapped into New York City. The other end is tapped into Philadelphia. So the, the, a lot of the philanthropy traditionally in New Jersey has flowed out into New York City and into Philadelphia. And we don't want anything to happen to them or, or to those distinguished institutions. The question is, what about us? What about here? All right. What about the children in our high schools and such? All right. And there was, when the state began significantly refunding the arts for the first time, there was pressure on then everywhere, the corporate sector and the private individual sector. And yes, they stepped up, especially when they were reminded time and again, week in and week out, that national figures show that you're not doing what you ought to be doing for New Jersey as in composed to other states. Um, and yes, there was there was an increase in private philanthropy. Um, most of these projects are not are simply not possible without private funds. Can I add something to that, Michael? Um, very much a Newark story is Ray Chambers, um, yes. who guaranteed, I believe, the funding for NJ Pack. Um, he's the son of Newark. And he, he was well known for saying he had been one of the richest people in America, but he was determined to give away most of his fortune. And a lot of it went here. Uh, so Chambers, Parsonet, there's a, a whole yeah. bunch of private individuals who were very successful people who, who put their, their money behind this endeavor. In the beginning with NJ Pack, there was a lot of hemming and hawing as to who goes first. And it was Ray Chambers who stepped up and basically said, I am underwriting $33 million. Yep. And that started the entire ball roll. Right. Gabriel, um, Bill May, who was, whose photographs are on an exhibit out there, uh, and it was so involved with the arts in Newark schools, has asked, talk about building a, a, feature, a future audience by working in pre-K to 12 schools. Where does that fit into the strategy? Sure. Um, so we do all sorts of work, and I'm looking at Marcel, who runs the team, our education and community engagement team. So I'm going to get it all wrong, and she's going to look at me and glare at me and make me feel embarrassed. But we do lots of work all throughout the city um, to try to develop not just young artists, but you know the audiences of tomorrow. And part of so that work includes our youth orchestra program we have a coach in residence program that goes into schools we do work with new york school of the arts uh, we offer uh, family concerts and children's concerts um, a whole plethora of activity and essentially trying to make sure that there's something for every child but also something for every audience member and you'll see that in the way that we have evolved our programming in the last few years to make sure that uh, audiences can recognize that classical music and or symphonic music and orchestral music underpins so much of what they love, whether it's listening to QXR or coming to the symphony on the weekend to hear Steve Mackey's piece, another plug, um, or it's going to uh, watching Star Wars and, you know, the John Williams scores. And we want to make sure that because we get money from the State Arts Council, which means everyone's paying, even though it's sort of related to the hotel motel tax, at least it's the way I think about it, every New Jerseyan is an investor in the New Jersey Symphony. It's really important for us that every citizen has something that they want to come to see at the symphony. So we, uh, we, we approach it um, from the viewpoint of education and working in partnership with a lot of educators to get give people opportunity give, give kids opportunities when they're young but then also making sure that when it's time to come to the hall that there's something that people want to come see well, i think that future oriented uh, uh answer is probably a good place to end there will be an opportunity i hope you can each stay around for a few more minutes for some personal conversations michael i suspect a number of people really yeah, want to I say can. hi to you as well I see some familiar folks. yeah so um, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you to our panelists, Helen and, and, and Michael and Gabriel for a, for a splendid program. And there is food and, and some uh, 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 soda and water and such. Uh, 
but I want to thank all of you for coming, and we will hope to see you at our next program in, um, in May, uh, when Larry Green of Seton Hall University will talk about the Black soldiers' experience in World War II and how that was reported and discussed in Newark and how it was a predecessor to the civil rights movements of the 50s and the 60s. Thank you and good night.